Chet. Thank you. And welcome, everyone. Let's intend we all learn a lot this evening. That's always a good way to start. And um, we had wonderful energy, music, and uh, I asked John and Tiffany to play some music and open it up because um, to balance our brain waves, to get us out of logical thinking and analyzing and, and figuring everything out. And, you know, we've learned a lot this weekend so far, and we're only halfway through. And one of the things I hope you noticed is how everything segues into everything else. And how each person that's presented, I've, I've listened to everyone or parts of everyone, um, how each of us has, has come from our own perspective. And, you know, you all come here and, you know, take time out of your life, your energy, your money to listen to a few of us who, who may be pioneers, may be on the cutting edge. And, and what I want to emphasize is that my own journey when I started, I guess when I was born, when I was really young, that's when I started, when I was really young, um, I always knew that something was missing. And I'm sure some of the things I'm going to share with you tonight from my own perspective of how I ended up here on this stage, uh, they're similar. We all have very similar experiences, and basically what it comes down to is how we interpret them and what meaning we assign to what's happening and how willing we are to think for ourselves rather than to be afraid to say, well, you know, I don't see it that way. And that's one of our biggest challenges in life for everyone. And we have to overcome a certain amount of fear in order to say, gee, I see that differently than you do, and then not only to say it, but then to live your life according to what's going on inside. So from the time I was very young, um, I couldn't figure out how I got here. I was born in upstate New York, small town. I was a village girl like my mother, like her mother, Polish ancestry. And it boggled me, even though I couldn't articulate it, that I lived in such ordinary circumstances. And, and that I was Catholic and Polish, and my parents, just my father worked, and my mother was a housewife, and my older brother had Down syndrome, so that marked us right away as a different family. And so I grew up with that, and knowing that some big things were missing. And I was a good student in school if I felt like it. Um, so I learned, you know, to not perform because someone wanted me to, but if I felt like it. And, you know, as the years went on, I felt like it less and less because, as you all know, you know, as we grow and start to conform to this whole mind control conditioning of education, what happens is we have to fit in these little slots in order to get accredited or acknowledged or approved. And, and so that's another way that we stop being true to ourselves and we start conforming. Today, because we're living in such an extraordinarily mediated world um, and, and, and media can be addicting, There's, anything can be addicting. Addiction is just a pattern, it's just a rut that we fall into and it becomes familiar and if, it, if it's a rut that involves trancing out or, or sort of dissociating from, from being present and conscious, then it's easy to take those kind of routes. And when you're on a spiritual path, <clears throat> pardon me, those tests are going to come up all the time. That's life. That's life. So I knew I was different, and I didn't know how different because I could fit, I could play the game. I was always popular, I was always in on everything. You know, I could lead, I, was, I, was a, I, I had good ideas, I always was an instigator, that was my father's nickname for me. And yet I fit nowhere. I fit nowhere because even before I understood psychic energy, I could look ahead and plot and plan and see, well, this is gonna go to a dead end, and this is gonna go to a dead end, and this is gonna go to a dead end. A dead end to me at that time meaning that I wasn't here to get married, have kids, settle down and have a job and maybe have two weeks vacation a year, which was you know, where the lemmings were headed, pretty much. It's, it's a way of controlling society. It's a way of controlling behavior to get people to conform and do certain things and keep up certain ideas. Those ideas don't have to be real. They don't have to be real at all. 
So <clears throat> I learned how to play the game. And, um, and then in the infamous 60s, um, I was right there in upstate New York doing my own version of the 60s. Uh, and probably my first feeling of, okay, this is an okay place and I think I'll stay here. Uh, and there's something more to learn. I was a summer, I was in college and I was working my, my, uh, my way through college and so I was waitressing and a friend at that time, it was, it might have been 68, Summer of Love. And um, a friend of mine said, oh, here I have this substance. Do you want to, you know, do you want to take it? And I said, what is it? And she said it was mescaline or something like this. I it was clueless. I had no idea what, what I was getting into. And I said, well, what's it going to do? And she said, well, you'll see cartoons and stuff come out of the wall and things like that. So, and I trusted this girl. She grew up in the same village I did, but she was just wilder than I was. You know, I was the wild thinker, but she was the wild doer. I was always a little more conservative because I had strict parents. And strict parents can be very effective. You know, sometimes we grow up and we have anger for our strict parents because they made boundaries. But, you know, if we don't have boundaries and we're not taught certain things and we don't have caution, then we don't understand what we're getting into. So my parents lurked behind me in some way. Uh, but I still broke the rules. So I took the substance, mescaline, and um, it was for me the first time I was really comfortable in my skin. And, and the answer that I got was, how did I get here? What am I doing here? What, what's, what's missing? And what really came through on that summer, beautiful summer evening, it was probably June or July, in, uh, upstate New York, Lake George, New York, in the Adirondacks, was that everything is alive. Everything is alive. That's what I knew. I, just like that. I saw it. I felt it. And I laughed the whole evening. I couldn't stop laughing because it was so joyous to me because everything before that was empty. You know, years of, you know, you're meaningless, you're sinned, you're flawed, all this programming that was just my experience. Think about everybody else's experience of family beliefs, traditions, societies conforming. So that was the 60s. And at the time, I didn't um, know anything about astrology. I was, you know, 20 years old or something like that. And I didn't start studying astrology actually till 20 years later, just after I started channeling. It was one of the few suggestions that the Pleiadians gave me early on to, you know, um, study astrology and work with a crystal. They said, hold a crystal. I have one in this bag or a big Herkimer diamond um, when I channel them. And I'm, I've always been sort of a a person who makes her own decisions and I don't like to feel that anyone's holding me hostage or, or leveraging me in any way. So when I first started chilling the Pleiadians, I wasn't ready to jump onto everything that they said at all. Not at all. But I did. I got a nice crystal from Herkimer. I grew up 13 miles from Herkimer, New York, which is a bed of, of crystals double terminated. They're called diamonds. And uh, of course, it's old Indian territory, Iroquois and that. And because I've learned that we do, the, the land does teach us the land where we're born and that there's a significance to where we're born and why, why we choose that area because we're walking again in our old shoes. You know, we do go back. And there's things that we know from other times that are in the ground. And sometimes we, we don't access those things consciously or really know what we're doing. But each of us is always walking a timeline. We're always sort of fulfilling some inner desire to be more of, of who we are. Because we're, we're born with a purpose. And we give ourselves that purpose. That's very obvious. And so when I was younger, I was looking for that purpose because I felt it inside, but there was no career. There was no anything in the world that interested me because I felt that I could see the corruption. I could see how people were dishonest. I could see how people were greedy. All they wanted was money. They would do anything for money. Or they wanted to work all the time. Or they would mindlessly have families and not know what they were doing and not understand the importance of being a parent and how you can affect a child for lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes. So, so there wasn't a slot for me. So I decided uh, after I finished school, I studied history. It's still a passion of mine. And I will, if I get to it tonight, talk a little bit more about uh, what we need to know about history, what's not taught in school, and certainly what's not on the 6 o'clock news. Um, so this psychedelic experience was the first of many. 
And in retrospect now, um, I, I see that I was very brave, I was very naive. Um, I had a core of trust inside myself and I had an excitement that was looking for knowledge. So those things were, were my intentions without even knowing the word or the concept at the time. So what those feelings did was they conditioned the space around which I journeyed into. Okay, And other people would stand next to me or hang out with me and journey in the same space, supposedly, and not have at all the same experience. And so I could see that early on. And I could see that the people who had very disturbing outward behavioral patterns that at that time I had no context for at all. Now today I, say, I see it comes from family trauma, incest, sexual abuse, who knows, I mean the worst end, cult activity, government interference, mind control, you name it, you know. And then cultural family bloodline stuff, reincarnational dramas. So all this stuff we carry inside of us very casually, you know, just very casually because if we carried it consciously, we'd freak out. We would. Yet it's all there, and, and this is what we're here to heal in this time. We're here to heal all this, and this is what comes up when people start going deeper. So in the 60s, that's what I saw, and of course later on studying astrology, I saw that um, there was a major event happening, you know, um, Uranus, planet Uranus, which brings sudden shocking surprising changes and revolution, was making an aspect um, that astrologers call a conjunction, and it was conjuncting Pluto, the transformer. And so anyone who would have understood astrology uh, would have known that, wow, around 65, 66, 67, the lid's going to be blown off of society. Now, I didn't know any of this, so I was a participant in the energy, and then I conditioned the energy to suit my own needs, which were always a person who was seeking, who wanted to figure out how I got here, what the real rules were, and what's, what's all the hidden stuff, what, what's really going on. So um, the revolution took hold in the 60s in a major way. And everyone here in this room pretty much was born, you know, after that, before that time. Few of you were born right around that time. Very poor, powerful to be born in 65, 66, 67, because these people will be, again, and Daniel Pinchback fits into this category, I believe, will be leaders uh, that will be very, very triggered uh, in 2010. But I'll, I'll get to that in a few minutes. Because there's cycles, these things start off, They're, it's like a moon, you know, you, we can watch the moon cycles, we can say, oh look, it's dark, <clears throat> it's the new moon, and then we see the first crescent, and then it goes to the first quarter, and then we go to the full, and then we go to the receding end, and these cycles show us something. Uh, women bleed with the moon in general, uh, people bleed much more when they have an operation at the full moon. You never want to have you know, any kind of surgery or anything like that at the full moon. Uh, the tides are higher at the moons. And so our bodies change. Look at hospital uh, and emergency rooms are always you know, crazier at that time. The police will say there's more activity at that time. There can be more battering, more brutality, more craziness, this kind of thing. So it's not just the moon that creates these cycles, that all the planets make aspects with each other and they make and they have cycles and this is some of the oldest oldest teachings that I've learned in, in traveling around the planet and leading sacred site groups and and studying alternative history and it's nothing that is ever ever brought up in any kind of educational institution or classes that I ever took it's it's not even it's not even factored in yet if you if you understand the cycles that the planets make and how they affect us as simply sort of i call it cosmic weather all right it's like when a cosmic event is happening, it makes weather, it makes psychic energy, and it brings out something. So in the 60s, many of us were responding from, from what was happening inside, yet many years later, in, in studying and learning, I, I saw you know, that what, another version of what was happening is that intelligence organizations were plotting and planning events where they could condition that that revolution that was happening, that transformative revolution, where literally, literally almost overnight, we broke away from our parents' values, okay? That's how we experienced it. And yet now, in retrospect, I see it was all part, a lot of it was part of behavioral modification, deep cover projects, 
that were designed to steer us at that time in certain directions. I think someone brought up today um, that how during the 50s, um, and, and of course always through shamanic uh, aspects, that things, substances from the living library or even, even um, chemical combinations such as LSD or mescaline were used in a therapeutic uh, aspect where people got in touch, like I did totally spontaneously and unexpectedly, and saw that we were connected to something that was vibrant, that interacted with us. And yet, when we left that state of consciousness and our brain waves went back to the familiar pattern, identity, costume of who we think we are, we could remember something great, but our perceptions weren't there anymore. And that was, you know, for me, a major frustration. It was like this accordion effect, you know. And what's happened over the years is that what I used to see and feel is so much more raw. It's so much more available now um, in just in regular everyday life. Everything is more activated. And for many reasons, from stellar effects, galactic effects, from people from people pioneering new ways of thinking on their own, all by themselves, figuring it out all by themselves, having the will and the desire to step out of the box, to validate personal experiences, to you know, go through our own personal stargates, to step through time. So you know, my experiences along that line really made a major difference for me. Um, for the time when I started channeling the Pleiadians. So 10 years after that, in the late 70s, I was living in Southern California, going through a bit of a crisis. I was 29 years old, and um, now I know, in retrospect, that in astrology, everyone goes through a big grow up, difficult, major, life slamming, <laughs> get off my lap <laughs> kind of situation. And so we do go through crisis. It's another cycle. It's the, it's the Saturn cycle. Saturn returns to the place it was when we were born for everybody around 29 years old. So it, it says grow up, take this energy of maturation and it's difficult. And so I was going through one of those. And, and so it precipitated me into a state of depression, which was totally unfamiliar to, to my personality. And I remember feeling so down and so helpless and so listless and so what's the point, you know? And I think sometimes we go through these things just to, to really relate to being human, to understand, as the Pleiadians would say, the whole two mile long piano of emotions that really make us what we are and that attract all these beings from all the different dimensions to come here because we have something that others don't have in that capacity. And those emotions have endless possibility for destruction or total enlightenment. So um, I responded to that energy and um, I started seeking. And at that time I came across um, the Seth material which was channeled by Jane Roberts. And I also started studying Hatha Yoga, both of which really at that age, 28 and 29, we all start building a foundation. Some people build a house, some people start a business, some people, you know, um, build a family, get married, have their first baby. But there's always something for everyone that they start building on at that age, and it starts to determine what you're going to do for the next other cycles of life. So um, when I started reading the Seth material, someone recommended it, and um, I gave it to my sister first, because uh, I was too busy with other things, and she wrote me back, and she said, thank you so much for giving me the secrets that unlocked my mind, and I was like, what the heck did she read that I gave her? So I rushed out and got a copy for myself, and, and I opened it up, and Seth's message is you create your own reality. And... I knew that that was like the key little instruction that all my searching till that time it was the key thing that was missing, that affirmation that said, you, you're the creator. For good or for ill, you're the creator. And it resonated with me so deeply because I knew I could think of things in my life, good and not good, that I energized and thought of and then they happened. So for me, all this was like personal, personal experience. And during, throughout all these years, I longed for a teacher. I wished that someone would show up that, uh, you know, would be my guru or my mentor or my teacher, and no one ever did.